I, I was interested, John, in what you were saying about um, the, the revenue earner side of things. Because I, I, I think back to when I was a reporter for Sky News, about 15 years ago, the big story was that petrol was going to cost one pound a litre. I mean, this was a really, really big deal, that it was going to nudge from 99 pence to one pound. And I had to go along to a, a forecourt and you know, speak to, to motorists and find out what they thought. It was a really big deal. And now, of course, that would be the biggest bargain of all. But back then, oil prices were inching higher and higher and higher. And before we knew it, we were talking about $100 a barrel. Uh, a couple of years ago, as we know, we know what happened. They crashed. And now we're, I think, what, 55 $55 a barrel, haven't checked the spot price today. Meanwhile, I'm still paying 120 pence per litre. So it's all about earnings, isn't it? So when you go and spend 120 a litre, and that's a UK price, I yeah. think I saw uh, 60, is it 16 krona, I think, a litre here, something like that. Around 80% or so, 70% of that is tax. I mean, the, the, the wholesale price of gasoline or diesel today, around 45 pence. Uh, 50 cents or so per liter. And so, uh, to a point I made earlier, it's, it's very good value, and it's a taxation opportunity. But we now understand the downsides of it better. And so we should indeed be thinking about how do we mitigate the GHG aspect? How do we manage the air quality aspect? But the point of the presentation that I gave is it doesn't necessarily mean you jump straight away to how do you move completely from that. There may be other routes. So there's not one winning technology. I think it was the same as you were saying. It's going to be a combination of technologies. Yeah, I think that's the general trend. And I think people from the modeling community also would agree to that, that there's no, at least among different models, there's no clear outcome, no clear winner. Uh, and uh, uh, also, it boils down to essentially what fuels and what resources we can use to produce the, the fuels and energy required to drive the vehicles. Mm. I mean, I guess I would say, having just given a presentation around putting electrification in perspective, I'd say, of course, it's a really important technology for the future. An engineer will tell you that the electric motor is the dream device for transportation because it's compact, it's very easy to control, it has very little maintenance. The issue is the electricity storage that has got the high cost and the high weight associated with it. But it's very clear, electrification is a really good technology and it'll be part of the mix uh, one of the descriptions we, we've heard that we think is a sensible way of thinking about this is the way it can be complementary with other technologies. And you look at plug-in hybrids and hybridization, already you're seeing that. It makes a very good vehicle to combine the technologies in, in one. So that's, that's part look, of Looking ahead, though, to 2050, will there be a role for fossil fuels in transport? I guess we see there'll almost certainly be a role for liquid fuels and that we ought to have a conversation about how we, de how we have evolution in the liquid fuel as well. Because certainly the aviation, the marine sectors will really struggle to move on from a liquid fuel. Liquid fuel actually is kind of the natural currency of energy in the animal world. There are no animals that store electricity, right? <laughs> and so, you know, the natural world has already yeah. shown us some indications. With one exception, things like the electric eel, but it's yeah. a tiny amount of electricity, <laughs> right? Yes, I can't really see us powering our, the, the next generation of motor vehicles with eels. It doesn't, doesn't quite work. I don't think we win awards for that. Let's bring, let's bring in um, the, the expert panel. I was certain that Mark would have something to say on this, on this session, but you seem to have gone quiet on the last few panels. I'm not picking on you because you're Irish. I'm picking on you because I was told that you <laughs> this was your special subject. But I tell you what, Chris, Christopher. You can go next, Christopher. <laughs> so um, as a veteran of LCA, I, I could say that LCA is quite dangerous in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, just as the presentations were going, I Googled several, uh, several LCAs that come to very different conclusions. But um, in, in any case, the, the, the thing I wanted to ask about was the 1,000 euro per, uh, per ton decarbonization uh, in John's presentation. Um, I think that that's kind of a misleading statistic because the point of electric vehicles uh, uh, subsidies is not decarbonization. It, it, is, uh, it is driving innovation. It's an, innov it's an innovation uh, uh, policy. So to, to, to equate that it's, it's the exact same issue with CCS that we've been discussing all, all day. It's an immature technology. Obviously, it's going to be expensive. That's the definition of an immature technology. So 
I guess I, I, I take a little bit of issue in trying to com compute the decarbonization rate associated with it when that's not the point of what the, the policy is trying to do. Gentlemen, response? Well, I guess I would say, uh, in terms of driving innovation, I think I have to agree. You can't expect innovation to come forward at an ETS price of five euros. I mean, I think there's been a, a great deal said about the failures of ETS. There's some fundamental correct things about having a carbon market, but with such a low price, it's not going to work. And I absolutely get the point that the regulators are trying to drive the creation of a new technology. That's fair. And it's sort of working. I mean, it's working more in terms of sponsoring uh, industrial development outside of Europe than inside, I, I would argue. But I think the point of our presentation is that Europe should think about at what point it looks to expect its technologies to be competitive. And we've heard this story that batteries will come down and down and down in price for five or six years now. We are still at the point where to get a customer to switch from the choice of a really good, efficient, could be a hybrid vehicle, to an electric vehicle, requires 10,000 euros of input. And so we're simply saying regulators and governments should pause for thought at some point and look for value in the money that the society is putting into this. You know, the, the, the presentation, sorry, the, the various projections of how we get to 2050 goals, many of them have tried to estimate what is the necessary carbon cost going out to 2050. I've never seen one that gets anywhere close to 1,000. People get into the low hundreds. Look at the 1.5 scenarios. Do you Sorry, think just side comment. I, I don't mean, think it's actually going to happen. I'm just, I'm just right. make, making the point. There, there are some out there. But yeah, it's, it's incredible, obviously. And that's, right. that's the whole point of putting out the $1,000 or 1,000 euro per, per ton statistic. It's never going to happen. We understand that. But I guess my point was, who cares? Because that's not what that that's not what the relevant statistic to measure that policy by. Well, uh, who cares? I mean, I suggest Europe should should care about getting the best value for money in what it spends. Europe wants to lead on the subject, and there is a question about what does leadership mean? Does it mean just doing more than everybody else, or does it mean trying to drive the right things to happen globally? You know, what is it worth to the planet to be wearing a badge to say, I did more than everyone else, if we spent a few trillion dollars doing that? You know, the IEA have said, e Europe can take its emissions to zero, and it'll make no more than 0.1 degree C difference, right? So, actually, creating technologies that require heavy subsidies are probably not exportable and not adaptable, not, you know, not adoptable outside of the, the political domain where, where it's been created, right? Mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, these, uh, these are comments and questions uh, re really related to the last session as well to some extent. I think Christoph said it very well that, you know, he said that uh, everybody says it's a bit of everything. Well, that's not true. I mean, there's no silver bullet, but there's dud bullets for sure. You know, I mean, this idea that it's a bit of everything is actually untrue. So I would completely agree with Christoph. But, you know, so no silver bullet, but there's definitely duds. And if you take, for example, in the renewable space, you know, go back 15, 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, we had wind, solar, ocean. Ocean? What happened to it? Dead. Gone. Finished. But actually, in the research community and the policy community, they'll still keep backing it. My own government, for example, will continue to back it. Why? Made a big investment a few years ago, and it won't give up on the investment. So I think there's duds. I, I don't believe it's a bit of everything. I believe there, there are a number of silver bullets. How about that as a compromise between the two? Um, if you look at the modeling issue, um, I'm a modeler, okay? I'm an electrical engineer, I model things. But generally when I model things, I have data, real data, not, you know, it's actually a real test, a laboratory test. Some of these models that people are running are complete. Well, I've said it before, the last session we had last October, I got into trouble for saying it. We run these models, there's so many parameters, there's so much data involved, you can make them say absolutely anything you want. But if you actually have a real model in a real experiment, then it's much more difficult to, you know, so you can't do experiments on these models, can you? I mean, some of these models you guys run, you simply can't do experiments. I mean, and is, the, are your, <coughs> else, uh, is your research real? Well, 
that's again. A, that's, well, yeah, no, there you go. That's well, a good question. Well, what I, I, I think is, it, it doesn't change is the fact that there's a lot of controversy on how we should actually utilize land. <coughs> and that, that was the point I was trying to make. Okay, there, there, of course, different outcomes from the models, uh, but there's a very confused policy scene as well. And clearly, if, if the, we think that the, the use of biomass for energy and fuel purposes is a part of the solution, then, then there needs to be done work to support that and communicate that even more clearly. There's, there's a lot of um, confusion, I would say, in the literature uh, and variation in results. And, and I think that, that makes it hard to, to move forward. The integrated assessment modeling literature on one side has quite, quite high shares of bio. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, these results are met, I would say, on, on, on the policy, policy scene and other scenes with ILOC literature saying that this is not uh, completely correct and we should include these factors and then it doesn't make sense to actually do biofuels. Now, I know there's confusion involved in this rhetoric and that's part of the problem. Uh, so, so I think there, there still is, is a communication challenge surrounding the use of biomass for energy purposes and then there's a scientific challenge which you point to which is the modeling and getting, getting uh, this right. So I, I think essentially, the, and my point would, was that there is this nexus where um, the, the bio touches upon both the energy sector, we have the negative emissions, the concerns about that, can we do all this afforestation that some of these models point to, can we have bio CCS, can we... So I think the land problem is, is a quite key one to both the energy and the transport sector that warrants attention, and I think that's my key message. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not that specific about this, I'm just making a general point that models are incredibly dangerous. I mean, there's people running them all the time, they keep together. I mean, your colleague said here he got how many different answers for LCA? I don't know, you know, he got different views. Are we not overmodeling? I mean, is the academic community not, not guilty of the following sin? You get money, you run a model, you publish a paper, and you just get in this endless circle, and there's more and more models. So if you talk to the policymakers, in fairness to them, I'm not a big fan of policymakers, but if you talk to them about it, one of the things they will complain about, and they're right, is that there's far too many models, far too many results, and they're completely confused. Is so that are we over-modeling? And it's a failure on our part as the scientific community to do our job correctly. Well, which is to I say that most of our models are incorrect. <laughs> Well, okay, we can have a very principled discussion whether we, you know, whether we should be doing modeling, what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was just trying to communicate that there are, there are indeed challenges surrounding the transport and energy sector, which points to how we should be managing land resources. And, and we should try to help give answers to that. So let's stay on message. I think we've got time for just one more um, comment. Um, let's go. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so I, I would like to look at how to translate your technological insight into policy advice. If you look at the Norwegian situation, uh, some of the major cities, they plan to, to implement zero emissions in their public transport systems in the early 2020s. And if you look at the uh, transport sector in general, uh, that's not part of the EU ETS system. And uh, considering we have to cut 40% of the emissions in the the, the system outside the EU ETS before 2030, and probably you have to cut between 40 and 50 percent in the transport sector. So my, my question is, um, uh, given that you're not willing to pick any winners, what kind of policy measures should we implement to ensure that these two, two objectives are, are actually achieved? And, and please note, I'm not asking if these are good objectives, I'm asking how to, to reach them. Well, clearly, right, you can have the type of carbon leak, you know, carbon leakage analogy, essentially you're shifting emissions uh, from the tailpipe in Norway, essentially to manufacturing in, in East Asia. So essentially, you are subject to that. So the question is how, what type of policies could you put in place to, to cap that? Uh, of course, if the manufacturing was occurring with inside um, uh, the, 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 the EU, it would be a, a, a different scheme, then you would essentially be covered within the, the same frame. But essentially, you are shifting uh, um, emissions from the transport to the manufacturing sector and potentially also out of um, a, a, a another policy regime. So clearly, uh, uh, there's no quick fix to that. Um, uh, uh, but I would say, um, um, uh, the, the debate has been towards whether one should try to also do, you know, introduce mechanisms that are based on life cycle emissions. So basically, producer responsibility type, um, and and um, uh, uh, so essentially uh, taking the carbon footprint also manufacturing into account on policies in the EU. I think 
that warrants a bit of thinking. It's a challenging thing to go in that direction. Um, I, I, I do think that then the larger global mechanisms are better to try to, to curb those emissions across yeah, sectors. So, so I, I and John, the last word? Uh, well, <laughs> it's, it's a great question. Um, and I would like to play it back from how we're regulated today as an industry. If you look at the oil industry and transport, it's got a very mixed picture in terms of the different pieces of regulation. You've got ETS in the manufacturing side. Five euros a ton is the cost uh, signal there. In the blending of biofuels, which we're required to do, apparently regardless of whether they're actually accepted as sustainable or not, we're required by law to do this, the actual carbon cost is two to three or even 400 euros a ton. And then there's also this, um, this push to substitute electrifi electrification technologies for uh, the use of liquid fuels, which we've illustrated seems to indicate a cost of a thousand euros or, or more. Then also, if you look in the vehicle, uh, the, the vehicle regulation, there are some very heavy high carbon price signals that exist there. There's a big gap in the middle, and we talked a lot about CCS earlier. It falls between the cracks in policy. In fact, I wouldn't describe it as a crack, I'd call it a chasm. Because just in our industry alone, we've got two carbon markets, the biofuels and the ETS. Five euros, 200. CCS in the middle doesn't qualify under the high market. It does qualify under CCS, but you're not gonna spend 100 euros a ton to save five. So the key point that I'd make longer term is we've got to actually align the policies we've got around a sensible carbon price. And long term, we absolutely will need a sensible carbon price across everything. And if we do it properly, we'll be efficient and we'll meet the targets. But we're more likely talking about 100 euros rather than five. That's the long term vision. In the short term, we've got to find ways of making the current instruments work. And unfortunately, the, the, uh, Tom from the European Commission isn't here. They're doing their best to bring the carbon price up. We're also having a conversation about how do we make more technologies work in transport to actually count. That's where we're trying to take the conversation. Thanks. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we are out of time, so we are going to have to leave it there. But a really great discussion, some super input from, from all of our panel. Put your hands together, please, for John Mandel. Thank you.